Hello, my name is Kane Barlow. I'm a mycologist and fungi educator. I really enjoy sharing knowledge about fungi. They're incredible organisms. They're really quite fundamental to our ecology and they're just beautiful, fascinating organisms. In this video, we're gonna cover some basics on how to identify fungi. So where do we start? The fungi in your local environment are based on where you are. What is your climate? Are you in a temperate or a tropical climate? What's the time of year? Is it spring or autumn, winter or summer? Your habitat, where are you looking? Are you looking in fields or forests? And of course, substrate. The mushrooms that you're finding, are they growing on dung or grass or wood? With all that in mind, and having researched the fungi that you're likely to find where you are and, and these other conditions, so your climate, time of year, habitat, substrate. How then do, are you identifying the fungi that you're finding? To begin with, it's important to observe and note the features. Try to identify the fungus that you're finding using a number of resources. There's lots of printed resources, so ID guides and uh, keys, which I'll, I'll come back to. There's also lots of really good online resources. So there's local Facebook groups. So try to join a Facebook group that's, that's local to your, to your region, not just your country, but to your more specific area. So if you're in Victoria, join the Victorian fungi group. Tasmania, join a Tasmanian fungi group. There are plenty of other resources as well. So there's the iNaturalist website or the iNaturalist app where you can take photographs, upload them, and other people interested in fungi can then um, identify your fungi for you. It's also a great way to explore your local environment. There are other websites as well, so Mushroom Observer, uh, and of course there's the Shroomery. I mentioned keys. So you'll notice on the right hand side of this slide, there's, there's a kind of a stepwise um, illustration where you can look at features of the mushrooms, like the gills, for example, how the cap is attached to the stem, um, the colors, etc., etc. And using the stepwise process, you, you can make decisions about the features and that will help you to at least to get to genus. I mentioned climate zones. So I'm gonna to talk to this very briefly uh, in case you haven't really thought about what climate you're in or, or where you are. Uh, if you're located in Australia, in Victoria, then the coastal part of Victoria and, and pretty much all of Tasmania is, is classified as an oceanic climate. Um, inland Victoria and parts of South Australia would be classified as Mediterranean, for example. And then as you head further north into northern New South Wales or Queensland, uh, this would be classified as humid subtropical. Knowing your local climate zone is important in terms of being able to work out what fungi you're likely to find in your local area, but also to help guide what ID guides to purchase for yourself. Uh, so there are lots of amazing guides and I will come back to these later in the presentation. So in terms of identifying fungi, um, I'm gonna to talk to a little bit of classification. So um, macro fungi are the fungi that we're looking for. And these are broken down into two broad groups, the Basidiomycota and the Ascomycota. I'm not gonna to talk to these specifically uh, because then we're really getting into in-depth fungi taxonomy uh, and we're just looking at how to identify fungi from broad features. There are an incredible variety of, of mushrooms. They come in all kinds of shapes, sizes and forms. There's the common agarics, so your guild fungi. Uh, then there are conchs, so Ganodermas, for example, there's polypores and leathers, uh, puffballs, earth stars, and bird's nest fungi. 
There are also corals, cages, stinkhorns, the sea anemone, acero rubra, cups, discs and morels and truffles. This, it, it's really quite astounding, the, the variety of different forms that the fungi have evolved for their different environments and their different ec ecological niches. So when you're looking at a fungus, does it have gills or pores? Or what other kind of spool bearing surface does it have under the cap? In most cases, we're probably the most familiar with, with the gilled fungi. These very, very thin, narrow structures that, that sit on the underneath of the cap. But some fungi also have pores, this sponge-like texture that, that sits on the underside of the cap with these tiny holes. Some have tiny holes and some have quite large holes. Other fungi have ridges, uh, and then some also have teeth. The fungi that we're focusing on today are the guild fungi. So what are the identifying features of, of agarics? So the main features are your pileus, uh, which is your cap, your stipe, which is your stem, lamellae, which are your gills, and then also the mycelium. Additional features that you might be looking at are uh, the universal veil, which is often um, present in the form of remnants on the cap. So Amanita muscaria is a great example here where it has those warts on the top of the cap. Um, also a vulva, so uh, Amanita phalloidus, the death cap, for example, is a great example there, where it has uh, this distinctive cap um, cup at the base of the stem. Other features are partial veils. Uh, some fungi have this beautiful cobweb kind of coating to the cap, and as the cap uh, expands, this, this partial veil kind of peels away. Uh, in some cases, these uh, partial veils are left as an annulus or a skirt. All these terms are illustrated here in this illustration on the right. We can then look closer at the mushroom and we can look at these finer features. So the gill attachments, how the gills are attached to the stem, and then also the, the cap shapes. It's important to keep in mind that the cap of a mushroom changes over time. Uh, so quite often a cap will start as, in, for example, in the case of Amanita muscaria, it will start out as, as globose so it's very circular, it will expand to become hemispherical, then in time it will become flat, and then later in its life it becomes upturned. Another aspect of the cap shapes is that fungi within the same species can also present with different cap shapes. So uh, some may have a hemispherical shape, whereas others, others may be bell-shaped, and others again, maybe really quite umbinate. Uh, so this is where it's kind of good to introduce other terminology. So for example, with gill attachment, because gill attachment uh, is quite consistent. So having a look at the underneath of the cap, at the gills and how they attach to the stem, uh, we have free attachment, attached, current and notched. When you start to go through your identification guides, you're gonna strike a lot of terminology. Some less so, some are really quite detailed. So it's good to have a bit of an understanding of some of the terms that you, you may find. So for example, when we're describing the pileus, the cap, uh, you might come across terms such as campanulate, which is bell-shaped, conical, uh, convex, depressed, flat, etc. In some cases, they may just use more general terminology. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, bell-shaped. Caps can also have other features. Uh, so some species, for example, have a separable pellicle uh, or they're hygrophonous. Hygrophonous meaning that the cap will change color over time. Uh, 
The separable pellicle is, is like a thin gelatinous layer that sits on the top of the cap. And when you break the cap and gently peel it apart, you'll, you'll find this beautiful gelatinous layer as illustrated in this slide. There are also a bunch of terms for describing the lamellae, the gills, and how they attach to the stem. So adnate, adnext, the current, which means running down the stem, free, not attached to the stem at all, seceding, uh, sinuate, decurrent, etc. And these are illustrated here on, on the right hand side. Uh, and in this slide, this is an example of an adnate to adnext attachment. Sometimes this can be a little bit confusing because movement of the cap means that that attachment can break. So it's, it's best to try to slice as best you can through the cap uh, to, to see how that attaches across a number of gills. I've included this slide to illustrate an adnate to adnext attachment. I've sliced this mushroom in half in order to illustrate how the gills are attached. In some cases though, you might notice that the, the gills have slightly broken away from, from the stem. Um, so if you find this as well, just slice again till you can kind of see what the attachment looks like. Another important feature of mushrooms is also their spores. Spores can be really helpful in identifying to different genera. Uh, so some fungi have brown spores, others white, pink, uh, etc. So it's helpful to do a spore print. So this can be onto uh, either foil or paper or, or even glass slides. Glass slides are great because depending on what spore colour um, you can still see them clearly on the glass whereas on paper or foil uh, this might be slightly obfuscated uh, due to the media. If you're interested in learning about how to make a spore print there is a fantastic resource on the Entheogenesis website under resources. I come back to keys again and I've mentioned a variety of different features, so gill attachment, cap shape, and spore colour. So if you look closely at this particular slide, uh, you can see this stepwise process. So looking to see whether gills are free or attached, what spore colours uh, a mushroom might have, uh, etc, etc. Uh, and you can step down through these choices to hopefully get to, to the genus of the mushroom that you've picked or you're interested in. Here we have Amanita muscaria, the archetypal magic mushroom. The mushroom that inspires so many stories of, of fairies and goblins and, and other mythical tales through history. It has that beautiful red cap with those really lovely kind of white warts, these little speckles that are remnants of the universal veil. If we look here at this mushroom here, this is an Amanita muscaria that's just emerging from the soil. You can see it has these cracks in the universal veil uh, as, as the cap is expanding. That universal veil is cracking and you can see the red, that beautiful red colour emerging from, from underneath. In time, this cap will expand. Unlike this specimen over here, the cap will become globose. Uh, you can see that the cap's expanded, the red's starting to show, and those, those warts, the remnants of the universal veil, are starting to spread apart. In time, it'll start to look like this, where the cap is a little bit more than hemispherical. Um, you can see the cap is slightly more than semi-hemispherical. 
it's going to expand and it's going to slowly flatten out uh, and will in time look like something like this here. Uh, in fact, this one's starting to upturn a bit. It's got a little bit of a cup in the middle and it's gathering water. You can see that the mushroom here in this state is also starting to lose some of that red colour. It's going slightly orange and slightly yellow. Uh, you can see here also the margins of the cap. Uh, you can see those, those gills starting to show through. And you can see here at the base of the mushroom. So this is the base. So this would have formed part of that universal veil. There's some little remnants left on the stem. Further up the stem, we have the annulus. This kind of partial veil here that would have protected the gills while the cat was developing within the universal veil. We have these beautiful white gills they're really distinctively white. And if you focus in, you can see that the gills have a free attachment. They're not attached to the stem. And then of course, there's that beautiful red cap with those white dots, those white warts, the, the remnants of the universal veil. Incredible, stunning mushroom. Now we can see the inside of the mushroom. We have that kind of beautiful red cap and we have this, this yellow coloration underneath that red layer. We can see the gills here with this free attachment. They're not attached to the stem at all. They're just attached to the underside of the cap. The bulbous base. And then we have this slightly hollow stem. We've been lucky enough to find Amanita phalloides. This is the death cap. This is a very, very poisonous mushroom. It grows in a mycorrhizal symbiosis with oak trees and, and you can see all the oak trees here scattered around it. Uh, it sometimes does get confused with edible species, particularly the straw mushroom. Uh, so here we have the vulva. So this is the remnants of the universal veil. This is the membrane that encloses the entire mushroom as it develops from its primordial state. As it grows, the cap and the stem expand and breaks free from this, this membrane, leaving this cup-like structure. In some cases, this gets washed away in some amanitas. So even though it may have had a vulva, um, it's no longer present. The stem will expand, the cap will then open, and the partial veil that's protecting the gills will then fall away, leaving the partial veil, which is uh, also termed the annulus or the skirt. This is the cap. You can see that kind of yellow that's becoming kind of ever so slightly olive green. Um, and underneath we have the gills which is this kind of white, slightly creamy, yellowy colour. And if we were to look right up underneath, we would see that the gills have a free attachment. So we can see in the reflection here, we have the vulva, which is the remnants of the universal veil. Further up the stipe, you can see the annulus, which is the remnants of the partial veil. And then we have the cap, the pileus, which is this a kind of yellow colour, slightly turning green colour. You can see the gills have this beautiful kind of white to slightly cream colour that is typical of Amanita. In all these videos that we've been doing, we've been speaking to active species. Uh, so I'm going to speak to the genus Olosobi and allied species. At the beginning of the presentation, I talked about different climate zones. So for, and this is kind of a good illustration of the different kinds of fungi that you're going to find based on your different climate. Uh, so in humid subtropical 
In tropical zones, for example, you're likely to find Psilocybe cubensis or Paneolus cyanesens. Examples of fungi in different climates. So I've mentioned uh, a couple of different climate types, uh, so humid, subtropical, tropical, uh, but also temperate. Uh, and these are two broad major zones that we have in Australia. So examples of species that occur in humid, subtropical, tropical, for example, in Australia are Ganoderma staetinum, uh, which is a very distinctive Queensland Ganoderma uh, that grows in forests, is Lignocolis, and grows on trees. Another species that's quite common is Chlorophyllum molybditis, uh, which occurs in open grasslands. This is a common lookalike for uh, for many of the macrolepiotas. Uh, so macrolepiota clolandii, for example, or macrolepiota dolichola that I have listed here. So both of these occur in open grasslands. For temperate species, uh, so in, for oceanic climates, for example, we have Amanita muscaria and also Amanita phalloidus both good examples of temperate species. So these occur in forests and parklands and they grow mycorrhizally in association with trees. So Amanita muscaria, for example, in association with pine, uh, spruce, birch and Amanita phalloidus in association with oaks. Another common Temperate species is the agaricus species that occur in open grasslands, the, the really common edible kind of foraged agaricus. And as a counterpoint to Ganoderma staetinum, uh, which only grows in, in humid subtropical regions, we have Ganoderma austral, which, which grows in temperate regions. So Tasmania and Victoria, for example, in forests and again, it's the same, it's Lignocolis, so it grows on trees. In a temperate environment, so the oceanic climate, uh, you're likely to find Psilocybe from the section Cyanesens. So in Australia, this will be Psilocybe subarachnosa. In North America or in the UK, this will be Psilocybe cyanesens. Um, Pacific Northwest of America, Psilocybe azurescens and Psilocybe alenii. Another temperate species is Psilocybe semilanciata, uh, which is found in Tasmania and Victoria, New Zealand, uh, but then also in northern United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Uh, another climate zone is humid continental, um, and I'm going to mention here uh, a species common in the United States, uh, Psilocybe Avoidio cystidiata. There are some common features of psilocybe. Uh, so many psilocybe share common features such as the, they're typically little brown mushrooms. They're solitary to gregarious uh, and they're rarely found in clusters. So they, they typically occur on their own or in, in groups of twos or threes. Uh, although in wood chip beds this changes quite dramatically and you can, you can find a huge mass of them in a small area. Uh, they typically have blue bruising of the cap, stem and gills uh, to varying degrees. So some species will only have a tiny little bit of bruising, but some species like Psilocybe subarachnosa will have quite a lot. This is, this is quite a distinctive feature, this bruising feature. Um, and I highlight the word bruising because we're not looking at the colour of the mushroom itself. This is a change in the colour. It's quite a dramatic change that may occur within minutes to hours. Another feature is the purple-black spore print. In some species, this is lilac brown and in rare cases where there's a genetic mutation in the pigment, the spores may actually turn up as, as brown, uh, which can be quite confusing given the brown spore prints of the lookalikes 
Gallerina and Cortinarius. They have smooth hygrophonous caps, uh, slightly sticky or, or a moist looking texture. And this cap changes colour as it dries out. So it will go from the beautiful caramel brown to um, a lighter brown or to even like a cream or kind of off-white colour. The term, the name Solosibi means bareheaded, and this refers to that separable pellicle that I demonstrated uh, in a few slides back. Many field guides still contain non-bruising Solosibi species, uh, and these likely are likely to have been moved to other genera, such as Deconica. Uh, I'm going to talk to some common field guides. So recommended field guides uh, include a field guide to Australian fungi by Bruce Fuhrer. It has lots of beautiful photographs uh, and some really good descriptions. This is a good overall guide for Australia. If you're looking to more specific regions, uh, say for example, your tropical to subtropical region, Australian Subtropical Fungi by Sapphire McMullen Fisher, and Patrick Leonard and Francis Gard is a really lovely guide for that area. For Tasmania and Victoria, a field guide to Tasmanian fungi is really good. Uh, and then there's also the matching fungi flip uh, that, that works really well with that, with that field guide. Wild Mushrooming by Alison Puglio and Tom May is a fantastic overall guide. It covers lots of the common edibles uh, and also some of the look-alike poisonous species. There's Fungi Down Under, uh, printed by Fungi Map. This is really helpful as well. Um, introduction to Mushrooms, Toadstools and Larger Fungi of Queensland is excellent. It's a really good guide. It's quite old now and getting a little hard to find but it's really well illustrated and it has really good keys in it. Some of the names are, have likely changed, so it's best used in conjunction with other books. A really good guide is Roger Phillips Mushrooms. Um, this is a UK guide, but it's also really helpful to, for getting down to genus. It's really well illustrated and it shows mushrooms at different parts of their life cycle uh, and and it has those cross sections that can be really helpful. The Field Naturalist Club of Victoria has lots of PDFs on their website uh, and these are highly recommended to download and have on your phone. I, the keys that I've shown come from a field guide to the common genera of guild fungi in Australia. This is a really, really helpful um, printed guide to have. Uh, it's got lots of laminated sheets in it. It's great for having in the field. Uh, for out in the rain or, or muddy environment. It's getting quite rare. Uh, it hasn't been printed now for a long, long time, um, but it's definitely worthwhile having. If you really want to get down to specifics, some good guides are the how to identify mushrooms to genus. There's a whole series of them uh, from one through to six. Um, they are starting to age a little bit now. There's some incorrect information uh, due to the species just having moved around to different genera. Um, but it covers macroscopic features to microscopic features and lots of helpful keys for getting down to family and genera. Uh, so these are some other useful field guides. Uh, so the Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Mushrooms uh, by Gary Linkoff, Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora, which is really lovely. It's a, it's a huge brick of a book, but it's, it's a really stunning guide to have. And it's got lots of keys. And lastly, I'm going to mention some Australian organisations and their websites. Uh, so most notably, Entheogenesis Australis, uh, and then there's also PRISM, Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine, the Australian Psychedelic Society, DanceWise, My Community Applied Mycology, and the forum, The Corroboree, which is hosted through Shaman Australis, which is an invaluable resource. 
Learning to identify fungi is daunting to begin with. There are new words to learn and a new visual language to take in as you learn the features. I would like to thank you for watching this video and hopefully it has helped clarify terms for identification and which resources to seek out for learning. If you are interested in knowing more about some of the species mentioned, there are a number of useful videos in the Entheogenesis YouTube channel. Thank you again for watching.